Which tune was that that just played? Ride of the Valkyries by who? Richard, Richard Wagner. Wagner. Yeah. What's this Wagner? Come on. Wagner. Okay, midterm topics. Midterm tips. Okay, you got that? Okay, done. Let's go on with the last one. All right, midterm topics. Truth tables. You're going to need to know truth tables. Practice proving expressions like A and B or C implies that not A and B and C, whatever, uh, stuff like that. So just uh, pra practice doing proof tables where you, you, where you want to prove um, expressions involving these symbols. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, also, you want to practice proving these types of expressions without truth tables. That means remember all the laws and theorems. Okay, De Morgan's laws. Commutativity. What is that? What is commutativity? Eric, yes. why are you in the back this time? You used to be in the front. Uh, I don't know. Why I'm in the back this time. Yeah. <laughs> What's commutativity for the AND operator? You don't need to be able to read it. There's nothing on that board that talks about commutativity. I'm asking you a question. A and B, what does it mean for the AND operator to commute in that case? Nope. Tejas? Uh, I think it's A and B and C by A and B. A and B uh, is logically equivalent to B and C, uh, B and A. Okay, that means you can switch them around. Okay, why are you saying A and B and C? Okay, you think of something else. Okay, associativity. Someone else now. Johan, pardon me. Associativity. What does it mean? So on on the exam, you're going to have to prove expressions involving these symbols without using truth tables, meaning using laws and theorems. If you don't remember what associativity is, how are you going to do the midterm? This is question number two on the midterm. Okay, so A and B or C, is that what you want? Okay, A and this is not associativity, is it? Okay, A and B or A and C, is that what you're saying? Okay, that's distributivity, isn't it? So that's not associativity. Last chance. Uh, associativity. I know, I know Paige knows. Brooke, you want to try? Yeah, I'm just the same for the first part, but on the right side, it's A and B. Oh, it's A and. A and. And then in brackets, B and C. Good, very good. And then in brackets, A and B. Okay, A. And B. And then close brackets and C. All right. How many people agree with these three? How many people don't agree? Okay. So, Johan, you said that this was associativity. This is distributivity. You know why? Because if I have money and I distributed some of it to you and some of it to Eric, that's like I have A, it's being distributed to B and being distributed to C, okay? 
So here I've distributed A to B, that's A and B. And then I've distributed A to C, that's A and C. Okay, I'm distributing my money to you and Eric. This is A distributed to B and A distributed to C. That's how you know, if you put down that this is the associativity law on the midterm, then you're putting down the wrong thing. It shows a misunderstanding of, uh, of the concept. And you're gonna have to know associativity, distributivity, commutativity. You're gonna have to know that throughout your undergrad degree. So it's time to memorize it now if you don't have it memorized yet. Okay, good. Associativity, that's an easier one. We have and, 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 and. It's just basically changing the brackets. That's all you're doing there, right? And commutativity, that's, uh, that's also an easy one. A times B equals B times A. That means integer multiplication is commutative. Likewise, A or B is logically equivalent to B or A. Okay, good, good. So you have to remember all these laws and theorems. The only one they're gonna give you in the reference sheet is De Morgan's laws, but I'd memorize that too. You've already memorized it by now. Uh, you don't want to be, you're going to, this is going to be a race. There's going to be 10 or 11 questions in 110 minutes. If it's 11 questions in 110 minutes, that's 10 minutes per question. Some of these questions, like the prime number proof, you're done it now, Grayson? The, yeah, how long did it take? Yeah. Another 10 minutes on top of the amount of time it took to figure it out. So if you only have 10 minutes per question, it's going to be a race. Most of you won't even finish it. So you don't wanna be looking at that reference sheet back and forth. The only thing they give you is De Morgan's laws, but uh, um, you should just know De Morgan's laws so that you can quickly just, you see something, it resembles something using De Morgan's laws. You can just immediately start doing the problem. All right, practice dealing with complicated nested quantifiers. These Mobius quizzes, you're given there exists X such that for all Y, this thing happens and that thing happens. And there's so many quantifiers and so many, um, so, so many uh, different things going on. You don't have to worry about three quantifiers, I think, but uh, when there's two quantifiers, there's gonna be a lot of questions like uh, write down the converse of the statement, write down the contrapositive. Uh, is the statement true or false? You're gonna have to know, there's gonna be, I think two pages worth of questions just on these there exists and for all hard questions like that. So look over all your Mobius quizzes. Who doesn't know how to find their previous Mobius quizzes? Who knows? Okay, good. Find all your previous Mobius quizzes and you just switched from Math 145 today, then you haven't done the Mobius quizzes. So that's, um, it's, it's a disadvantage, but uh, you knew that when you chose to switch from Math 145, okay? Um, okay, when can you switch them? They're existing for all, for all and they exist. When can you switch them? When can you switch the, the order of these? When they're the same. So if you have there exists, there exists, there exists X and there exists Y, then you can switch those. If I have for all X and for all Y, I can switch those. When can I switch it if I have uh, there exists and for all or for all and there exists? Under what circumstances can I switch them? Eric? This is a different, so these implications, uh, th that's a different story. This is just, um, if you have statements involving these quantifiers, their existence for all, uh, typically you should not risk switching these around. So if it's there exists K for all Y, you should not risk switching them around because it doesn't always work, okay? So uh, you should know um, not to switch those. You should know, you should understand logical equivalence. Like uh, it's uh, A, A is logically equivalent to B. If A is true and B is true and, what else? Is it enough that A is true is A is true and B is true for logical equivalence? No. What else do you need? A is, false when B is false. A is false when B is false. So it's not just, it's, it's not enough that uh, A is true and B is true for logical equivalence. You also need that when A is false, B is false. Okay, when you switch them, uh, when can you switch them? When can you not? How do you negate these? How do you neg negate something with their existence for all? 
you you switch uh, you switch the there exists to a for all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, converge that's supposed to say converse and contrapositive. So you have to be able to do contrapositives and converses and negations and and if there's something there exists this and for all that then you have to be able to say whether it's true or false. You really need to know that stuff because there's going to be two pages worth of questions just on this stuff. Look at your Mobius quizzes. Practice working with complicated sentences containing these quantifiers. Okay, sets. How many people are not done reading chapter five? Yeah, chapter five, still not done reading. How many people are done reading half of it? Uh, chapter five in the course notes. Half or more, yeah. How many people are done reading chapter five? Very good, Jimmy, Grace, and Mercedes Page. Very, very good. You've got to read chapter five. That's got to be, you have to know sets because there's going to be two questions on sets, I think. Two hard ones. Grayson? Um, I know, yeah, yeah, that's true. So this, I was just going to, I was about to get to this, okay? So in my slide, when I was preparing this, I said, you absolutely need to do both set theory questions from assignment five. Uh, because those are hard questions and they're resembling what the midterm is going to look like. Now, I found out right before I was about to start teaching my first class, the course coordinator said, we're not going to give the assignment to the students until October 20th. Okay, so on one hand, I felt like it would be good for you to get some practice questions that are similar to the midterm. And I know assignment five has some set theory problems, which are similar to what the midterm is going to have. On the other hand, I also agree that um, if we give you the assignment now, then you're worried about this assignment when you're supposed to be focusing 100% on the midterm. So there's three questions on this assignment five, which are not about set theory. And you don't want to have this extra stress saying, oh, I got to do this midterm. There's another thing for me to do during reading week. We're just going to give, give you the assignment on October 20th. So between uh, now and October, well, between now and the midterm, Try to find as many set theory problems you can you, you can get access to, either on the uh, previous exams or in the um, course notes. You have the course notes, Tejas? Uh, yeah, I do. Good. Okay. So you got to read up to chapter five and um, practice as many set theory problems as you can find uh, because we're not going to be giving you the assignment in advance. But I'm telling you, there's going to be two set theory problems where it's like prove that this set equals that set or something like that. Nola? Uh, Maybe, I haven't looked at the practice problems uh, thing. So given A and B, these are sets. They're defined using set builder notation. Everyone knows what that is. Everyone knows what the vertical line means and what, uh, and what, what, what all the, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so you know what the uh, colon means, but they said that in the course notes. Okay, so you know what it means, and you know that they're recommending you for to use something else, so you know all that stuff. All right, good. All right, so you have to be able to prove what, what does this mean? A something B, what does that mean? It's a subset. subset, and this line underneath. It's squiggly if it's proper subset. Yeah, exactly. So this is kind of like less than or equal to. A can be B, but it, it can also just be a subset of B. Um, what's the squiggly line you're talking about? What? Okay, why don't you see it? Well, you don't have the printed copy? No. Printed copy is uh, what I recommend using. What does this mean? Uh, rows? This one? This is and? That's in chapter two, we, we did and is this one. What if you have a round top? What's this? Tages? Intersection of those two sets. Okay, uh, then we have things like uh, prove that A minus B is the empty set. You're gonna have to prove, and these problems, 
I think the two hardest problems on the entire midterm are, are going to be set uh, problems involving sets. So it's going to be like S equals the set of all integers such that X squared is greater than uh, 3X plus 1 or something like that. And T is the set of all real numbers such that uh, 3Y three, uh, three plus 2, where Y is a real number, uh, prove that the intersection of these two sets has uh, some number of elements or prove that the uh, A minus B is the empty set or prove that the union of the two sets is smaller than the union of two other sets, you know, or prove that A equals B or something like that. You know, uh, you have to convert that set theory, set builder notation into a mathematical statement like A divides B and C divides D. Grayson knows what I'm talking about. So they had problems like that in the course notes. Uh, that one, they got examples of different complicated ones, but they had Okay, so they're going to have things like uh, X is the set of integers such that X divides uh, 4Y plus 1 or something, and you have to convert, you have to really be comfortable with sets, all right? Those are going to be the two hardest questions on this midterm. Look over the assignments. So look over all of the assignments. Okay, assignment three had things like if A, then B or C. You have to know how to prove that, okay? Do you have to prove that A implies B and A implies C, or do you just need to prove that one of them is true? What if you have A and B implies C or D? Then what do you have to prove? You have to prove that A implies B, A implies D, A implies C, B implies C, B implies D. Do you have to, impl do you have to prove all of those, or do you have to just prove some of them? You have to know which ones to prove. You really, really need to know this kind of stuff. If A, then B, or C, you've got to be able to prove that thing really quickly. If and only if proofs. Prove in both directions. Don't forget that. It's not enough to just prove that A implies B. B also has to imply A. Binomial theorem. This formula will be given to you both version one and version two of the course notes. It's going to be given to you on the reference sheet. So don't worry about memorizing the binomial, the uh, bi binomial formula, but make sure you're comfortable using it. So there's going to be one binomial theorem question. They're going, to you, they're going to give you something like, I don't know, like x plus y to the n minus x, x plus y to the uh, x plus y to the n minus x minus y to the n. You're going to have a summation notation thing for the first one and a summation notation thing for the second one. And then you're going to have to simplify and prove that it equals some other thing. Okay, so you have to be very comfortable with that summation, summation notation. Practice as many problems as you can from the course notes. All right. Uh, when you're reading the course notes, who got confused when reading the course notes for the binomial theorem? Hey, come on. I know some of you guys got confused. Good. That's good because they, in my opinion, the course notes could be improved significantly because they said that X plus y, actually they used a and b, so let's just use a and b. Okay, so they said a plus b to the n equals the sum from m equals zero to n of n choose m times a to the n minus m times b to the n. And they said it's true for all real numbers a and all real numbers b. Now what's zero to the zero? One, how many people think one? How many people think undefined? Hey, Tay just thinks it's undefined. Okay, so zero to the zero. They said this is true for all real numbers, A and B. So what happens if A equals zero? If A equals zero, we have B to the N equals some stuff where we have uh, zero, we have B to the N here, and then we have zero, to the n minus m. And we're summing from m equals zero to m equals n. So m will eventually equal n, and then you'll have n minus n, that's still gonna be zero, right? So it says that this is true, that the left side and the right side are true for all real numbers a and b, that includes a equals zero. And when a equals zero, you're gonna have b to the n equals b to the n times zero to the zero, plus a bunch of other stuff. So we're gonna use the convention that zero to the zero equals one. If you Google it, zero to the zero 
Sometimes it's undefined, sometimes it's one. It depends on the convention of the person writing the proof. And in the course notes, they didn't say this, but they're saying that this equals that for all A and B, real numbers A and B. That means that they implicitly use the convention that this equals one. Okay, Grayson? They do say actually. Where? Uh, page 74 in this context, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Oh, okay. Someone asked me about this. Where's Robin? I can't even see Robin today. Where's Robin? Where is he? Oh, he has good loyal friends. They won't tell me where he is. <laughs> okay, he's just not here. All right. Well, Robin asked me this question during the office hours. And from what I looked at, it didn't look like they made it very clear, but Okay, zero to the zero is one, that's good. Okay, sometimes it can be undefined, sometimes it can be one. If that equals that, then it means zero to the zero is one in that context. Good, strong induction involving sequences. These should be easy for uh, easy by now. I, have, uh, I wanna prove that A, uh, prove something about A n where A n equals two A n minus one plus three times A n minus two. How many base cases? Two base cases, because my thing depends, my expression for a n depends on two previous values of a, uh, of a. So I have two base cases for that. And then uh, what's going to be, if I want to say prove that a n uh, is less than or equal to square root of two to the n, then what's going to be my induction hypothesis? I want to say, uh, so prove that uh, a n is less than or equal to the square root of two to the n, then what's the induction hypothesis? Okay, quickly, come on. Yes, uh, Alina. No, I was asking if n is and Oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah, you can, yeah, so, but, but what's, what's the general, so if, it's, if I say prove that, then I wanna assume, that right so assume that this i'll say a r is less than or equal to square root of two to the r and then uh, i'll say that uh, r is between one and k where r and k are both integers and k is larger than or equal to the last base case right so if i want to prove this then i assume this People are always getting confused about what should my induction hypothesis be. Well, well, here I said, yeah. So I said for some r between one and k. It's not for some k. It's for some r where r is, is anything up to k, not uh, not um, any. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's true up to some k. This k is a number. It's not infinity. It's a number. It can be anything. It can be billion. It can be trillion, but it's just it's a number. It's chosen. All right. So assume a r is less than or equal to two to the r. Whatever the whatever the, whatever the thing you want to prove, that's the thing you're going to assume. Okay. Assume that this is true. R can be between one and k, where r and k is in the integers. K is bigger than or uh, equal to the last base case. You should just be able to write that part immediately. Don't waste time. You only have 10 minutes per question. Some of these questions, you saw the previous midterm. They said prove that the number of primes is infinite. You know how to do that, Tejas? OK, so you're going to have 10 minutes to figure that out. So you might as well, when you have a problem like this, you should just quickly be able to write down the assumption immediately. And don't think about if it's simple induction or strong induction. Just do that. All right. You know difference between strong induction and simple induction? Yeah. Okay. What did David Zhao say to use? Uh, well, he used uh, strong induction on one of the problems. He also used induction. Okay. Yeah. So we're just going to use strong induction all the time because whenever you if, you, if you can use strong induction, then you can easily use simple induction. It's just, it's just an example of strong induction in some, some sense. Okay. So. In this type of problem, now you want to prove this, and you have some sequence like a n equals two a n minus one plus three a n minus two. So, what's going to be the first step of your proof? What are you going to start with? 
based cases, yeah, and then in the induction based cases, then induction hypothesis, and then the induction step. What's going to be the first step of that? We consider our definition. You start off with the definition of the sequence. This is the definition of an. We don't play around with definitions. Definition is the definition. So you write down the definition, and then. The then you start plugging in okay we have the definition a n equals 2 a n minus 1 plus 3 a n minus 2 then you say each of those a n minus 2 and a n minus 1 you plug that into there and then you keep going until you get that this thing is true for k plus 1 okay that procedure should just be so easy by now you just practice it so many times that this induction question should actually be the easiest question on the exam for you Proofs involving dis divisibility. You've had a lot of practice. I showed you previous midterms. I showed you, uh, you had assignment questions. Um, if A divides 7B minus 2 and A, uh, A does not divide 7B minus 2 and A does not divide 6B minus 1, what's the first thing you're going to do? Oh, do the contrapositive because we don't like the does not divide symbol. It's easier to prove that things divide each other than does not divide each other. And then if you have something like A, then B or C, then you're going to have that it divides this thing or it divides that thing, but you're doing the contrapositive, so you're changing it, you're using some De Morgan's laws, you have an and maybe, then if you have that it divides this and it divides that, then you're using what? Something divides something and it divides something else too. DIC, divisibility of integer combinations. Easy. What about A divides B implies B divides C? What's that called? Transitivity of divisibility. You got to know all that stuff, okay? All right, so proofs involving divisibility should be easy. I mean, just, you know, for divisibility of integer combinations, the hardest part is getting it into a form where you can use uh, DIC. So you might have A divide something and 3A divide something. Okay, then what are you going to do? If you have, a, you don't have that A divides B and uh, A divides C. You have A divides B and three A divides C. What are you, how are you gonna use DIC? Transitivity first, okay, yeah. So A divides three A and three A divides C. So then A divides C. Now you have the A divides B and A divides C. So you use uh, um, DIC. All right, polynomials. You're gonna have to know all the polynomials. Tejas, you found the course schedule online? Okay, so polynomials up to some certain chapter, up to some certain, and you know the difference between chapter zero and chapter 11? Okay, so in the book, there's some chapter 11 at the end of the book, but it's taught assuming that you know chapters one to 10. There's also on learn, you can find chapter zero, which is polynomials without needing to know chapters one to 10. So uh, the polynomials chapter, you have to read chapters uh, 0, 0.0 up to 0. 0.5 or something, whatever it says in the course schedule. You've got to read chapter zero instead of chapter 11. All right, midterm tips. Please, as a favor to me, use the entire time. You're given 110 minutes. Don't walk out after 90 minutes, okay? I'm not impressed that you finished it early. In fact, back in 2007, 2008, I used to give people zero if they submitted the exam before with time still remaining. If there was still 10 minutes remaining and you submitted the exam, like, okay, you get a zero. You didn't, you didn't complete the exam. You didn't sit there and uh, double check all your work, make it neater for the graders and all that. There was an exception. If the student got perfect, then I didn't touch their grade. I, I gave them perfect. If they, if they finish it in 15 minutes and they get a perfect, then 15 minutes is all they needed. They didn't need to stay longer. But if there's just one mistake, just one, even a half mark that this person got wrong, then they get a zero. Basically, they've, they're so arrogant that they think that they're done. They didn't, they didn't spend the extra 10 minutes given to them to look over their exam and actually, uh, and actually double check to see whether or not they, I mean, uh, I used to give them, this was 2007, 2008. Um, when I was a grader, so I was a teaching assistant in that year, and as a grader, I gave people zeros for doing that. Uh, now I'm not grading it, so you're lucky. Um, and I don't even know if they would be allowed to do that anymore, but uh, the bottom line is I'm encouraging you, please, like as a favor to me, spend the entire time. If you're done early, 
you can relax a bit, take a five to 10 minute break maybe, and then go over and just look over everything. Just make sure. I want you guys all to do well. That's, that's what this is about. Like, what's the benefit to me? I just want you guys to do well. I just want you to have a, a bright future and uh, success in your future courses and stuff. And uh, the best way for that is to get, is to build up the confidence by getting 100% on your midterms and exams and stuff. So that's what I'm encouraging you to do. Now, uh, first thing, a lot of people get the midterm and they immediately start trying to do things fast. Relax, get the midterm, go through it, okay? Make yourself aware of what's coming next. The first question, you might start spending half an hour on this first question. You don't even realize that that's actually the easiest question. There's some really hard questions coming later. Make sure you're aware of what's gonna be coming next. So just go through the whole midterm quickly, read all the questions, know what's gonna be coming, then uh, you know, spend two or three minutes just reading all the questions first. Because you don't know, is the first one really a hard question or an easy question? Are you gonna waste, how much time do you wanna spend on the first question? You don't even know yet because you don't know what the other questions are. Okay, get all the mechanical questions done right away. What does it mean by mechanical? Grayson? Things like truth tables. Things like truth tables. That's an example of something that's mechanical. What else? I guess you know how to require a lot of like deep thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's just some mechanism that you're following. Okay, there's just a mechanism. Like, uh, you know, the mechanism of filling in a truth table. Okay, so truth tables. You just, you just follow the mechanism. You have A, B not be, you just change all the falses to trues and all the trues to false. That's just mechanical. Logical equivalence proofs, that should be fairly mechanical. Um, you just keep applying distributivity, commutativity, associativity, um, uh, negations and implications, whatever, like all those different De Morgan's laws, you just keep applying those until you get the left side equals right side. This is mechanical. There's relatively easy divisibility proofs. You've seen like 10 examples of them now, previous midterms had questions that were exactly the same as the assignment, just with different numbers, like A divides 7B minus two and 3A divides 9B minus one, then uh, uh, prove something about this and that, then you should know like just step-by-step, step, you just first convert it into a form where you can use DIC and then, yeah, and then convert this uh, A implies B or C into whatever that ends up becoming and then just prove, it's just it's, it's relatively easy. That becomes fairly mechanical. Induction proofs should be quite mechanical by now too, uh, because, well, at least the relatively easy induction proofs, that means you have a sequence AN defined in terms of some previous AN, and you wanna prove that you can quickly just write down the assumption, just, I don't even know what the sequence is, but I already know that my assumption, my induction hypothesis is gonna be exactly what I wanna prove, just with N replaced by R, and then I just write this down, just memorize, you just memorize that, just write it down every time. It's mechanical, okay? You just do this, you just do the same thing over and over again. There's a mechanism behind how these things are proven. Relatively easy binomial theorem proofs. So manipulating expressions in summation notation. I have A plus B to the N minus A minus B to the N. You just plug in the summation notation for the first one, plug in the summation notation for the second one, and then keep just doing some algebra until you get whatever they want you to prove should be fairly mechanical. These true or false questions can be quite mechanical, just like there exists X such that for all Y, X is bigger than Y, then you can say if that's true or false. Some of these true or false questions can be hard, okay? I mean, no one's got 100% on all of their Mobius quizzes so far. Some of these true or false questions, they can be tough. So be careful. If you start thinking for too long, get away from there as quickly as you can, start doing the rest of the midterm. If, some, if you get stuck and it's taking you three, four, five minutes to do a true or false question, get out of there. Just start doing the next question. Just um, you know, don't get stuck for too long on one question. And this isn't about proving how smart you are. This is about just getting the highest grade. So switch to a different question, then come back later. So you can mark pages that you're complete. If I'm done a page, if I'm done everything on that page, I'm going to just put a check mark in the top right corner so that for the rest, then when I'm going back and trying to do all the uh, things that I left out, then I know, okay, that page is done. If it's not done, I might put a circle or something. Then I know, like at the last 
At the end, I have 10 minutes left. Okay, quickly go back. Oh, I completely forgot that an hour ago I was doing that question. This It's 110 minutes. Doesn't sound that long, but it can seem like 15 hours, right? Because you're doing this midterm. It can seem like it's a really, really long time. You completely forgot that an hour ago you were working on some true or false, and you forgot that you did all of these true or false, and then there's one true or false that you skipped. You might have forgotten that you, that, that you didn't do that. So just give yourself a note so that at the end, when you're going through the exam, you remember, I didn't do that. Okay, good. Proofs. So it might not be obvious where to begin. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? It says, prove that the number of primes is infinite. You have no idea what to, how to start that, right? Do I do contradiction? Do I do induction? Like, I have no idea. Okay, so for some of these, there's going to be some of these proofs which are hard. Like you're going to look at it, and you're going, to, oh, I've never seen something like that before. This is crazy. Like, how do they even ask that? Do they even ask the right thing? Like, this is—is is this 145 or 135? I've never seen that before. So give yourself an hour to do these hard questions. So do all the mechanical stuff first, and then give yourself at least one hour to just do all these um, uh, these hard proofs. So if there's ten questions. And four of them are hard proofs, and six of them are mechanical or easy proofs, like induction that follows this usual pattern. Then I would spend 40 minutes on the easy questions and one hour on the hard question. That's an hour and 40 minutes. Now you have 10 minutes left, 10 minutes going through and double checking all the mechanical questions and if the proofs were easy. Or you can spend, if, if, if you have 10 minutes left and you're sure about all your mechanical proofs being correct, then you can spend time on the, uh, on the more difficult proofs, more time on the hard proofs. In order to even do this time budget, you need to have seen the question. So that's why I'm saying you get the you get the midterm, just quickly go through and see what's see what you're up against. So in order to do this four hard proofs, six mechanical proofs, that budget, you've got to look through the uh, midterm at least once. All right. Now go to the midterm room earlier in the day so you know where it is. Every year there's someone that goes to the wrong room. They either come to this room because they assume that because their lecture is here, then this is going to be one of the midterm rooms, but you might not have assigned seating here. Okay. Uh, there's going to be assigned seating because they might know, they might assume, oh, Marissa and Alina are working together. So we don't want them to sit next to each other. It's not like that. It's more of an alphabetical randomized thing. But, you know, the truth is that if we just let you sit wherever you want, then you end up sitting next to your best friend. You and your best friend have a deal with each other that you're going to, you know, exchange answers or whatever, then so uh, I think the uh, midterm, how many people have gone on Odyssey? You've been on Odyssey? Does it give you your assigned seating yet? No. Okay, so the assigned seating is going to be done by Odyssey. And if, uh, if it's three days before the midterm and you still don't know where you're going to sit, then ask on Piazza how to figure it out on Odyssey. I'm not going to waste 10 minutes of my um, uh, lecture time to explain how to use Odyssey, but uh, figure out where, which room you have to go to. And uh, it might be a different building. It might not be the math building. It might be STC. There's midterms in STC. Who here knows where ST is? ST, who here has been to STC? Ah, that's because of the Starbucks, isn't it? No? Because you have a class there. Okay, science teaching complex. What if it's in uh, RCH? Where, where, where's RCH? Has anyone been to RCH? Jimmy has been to RCH. You have a class there? Engineering? Okay, it's an engineering building. What about if they say PAS? Who's been to PAS? You've been to PAS. So 90% of the class hasn't been to psychology, anthropology, sociology, but those, we might use that for a room. We have 1,300 students trying to write the thing at the same time. Then we fill up all the MC rooms and then we've got to use some other buildings too. Some of these buildings, like, you know, PAS, how far of a walk is it from here to PAS? How many minutes is it going to take you? It's pretty far. She doesn't even tell me the number of minutes. So some of these buildings don't think like, oh, it's five minutes to the midterm. You're studying until the last minute. And then there's five minutes to the midterms. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. I'm near the math building anyway. Then you realize where your building you have to go to. It's 40 minutes away. Okay. Some, some of the buildings can be 40 minutes away walking. So go there early in the morning, make sure you know where to go. Even once you get into the, once you get into the building, you might not know where room 2315 is, okay? 
PAS, that building, it's a maze, isn't it? You know how you know your way around there? I, I just went inside and explored. And then you and then you left. Yeah, because apparently the inside of it was meant to look like a brain in terms of the architecture. So all of the rooms, like it's lobes and stuff, like <laughs> you know, like the lobes of the brain. So all the hallways are like that. You will get lost so quickly. Make sure you can find your room well before you actually start the midterm. Bring enough lead, sharpened pencils, good quality erasers. Make sure you can erase, not the type of eraser where you erase and it becomes darker than what you started with. Make sure it's like you have the good quality erasers. Practice using it. Make Sometimes the brand new eraser, it sucks. But then once you've used it a lot, then it starts to become good. So you've got to have all that stuff, OK? Your lead, your sharpened pencils, your erasers. You've got to have that before you start. Okay, winter is, I mean, midterm is coming. What should you do? Okay, I gave you a bunch of practice, uh, practice exams and stuff. I told you do uh, on six different days, do six different midterms, time yourself and all that. It turns out that might not work so well because on a given midterm, if there's 10 questions, you might only be able to do four of them because some of the other questions were from other parts of the course. They switch the order. So if there's if there's a midterm where it's talking about mod or RSA or GCD, then that's not relevant to this midterm. So it's a ten it's a ten question midterm where you're only able to do four questions. Then timing yourself doesn't make much sense anymore, right? So I would go through those midterms on the exam bank. If it looks like something you know how to do, if it's about divisibility or it's about um, I don't know, divisibility or like uh, induction or something, there's some sequence and you want to prove that it equals this for all n, then you can do those ones. Uh, and then in addition to that, on learn, you have these extra practice problems. Do every single one of these. There's no excuse now. You have it 10 days now. You have 10 days, do every practice problem. We have a habit of reusing previous questions on midterms. So if there's a question where you've seen the proof before, you can do it so much faster. All right. Um, uh because you have 10 minutes for each question 11 questions you're not going to be able to figure out everything in just 10 minutes so it's good if you've seen a question before you can quickly do that proof and then on shane bauman if you click on content then uh instructors then shane bauman there's practice midterm proofs and then practice midterm proof solutions all right so get those try all those practice questions and then here you have uh, extra practice problems. The solutions are not given, but you can ask questions on Piazza if, you, if you're curious. All right. Uh, apart from that, there's a sample midterm on Learn. How many people have looked at it? How many people have not? OK, so there's a sample midterm from 2019 or something. That one, you can actually time yourself and do the whole thing and then look at the solutions later. So you can at least time yourself properly on one midterm. The rest of it, exam bank and all that stuff, you just do that, um, you just do that uh, yourself. All right, okay, this class 90%, my other class 90%, the entire class 90%, so we've got to do better. If the entire class is getting 90%, we have to be getting 95. Uh, for those two people that didn't do the assignment, this was one of the easy ones. We have 50% of the users getting 100%, so you just missed out on an easy, on an easy uh, uh, quiz. All right, so on the course schedule, it tells you the midterm is going to be weeks one to five. So don't study chapter six, seven, eight, just chapters one to five. Uh, ignore practice midterm questions that aren't relevant, like RSA questions and GCD questions and all that. All right, so prove that the number of primes is infinite. How many people tried this at home? Good, good, good. And now you know how to prove it? Okay. Can you name an early mathematician that proved this a long time ago? Ah, but I gave you the answer. Uh, I gave you the answer on MS Teams because you were you missed last class and I talked. I, I've seen this. Oh, you've seen this. Okay, yeah, yeah. So Euclid's proof. What's the what's the name of Euclid's most famous book, uh, series of books? The Elements. All right. So Proposition Twenty of Book Nine, The Elements. All right, Tejas, you ready? This was a question on the uh, spring 2006 midterm, Math 135. You have a few minutes to prove that the number of primes is infinite. You don't have a lot of time. You've got to do this quickly. OK, assume there's a finite set of primes ordered from smallest to largest. It's going to be P1, P2, up to Pn. So there's some finite set of primes. Let P be the product of all these primes. 
Okay. Let Q equal P plus one. All right. Now, case one, if Q is prime, then F doesn't contain all the primes because it doesn't contain Q. There's a new, there's a new prime that wasn't in the original set. Of course, Q is not in the original set because PN is the largest prime in this finite set of primes and Q is bigger than it, right? Q is larger than it and it wasn't in that set. So that set was incomplete. It doesn't have all the primes. What about in case two when Q is not prime? If Q is not prime, then it contains some factor R which is not Q and not one. It's not a prime number, it's a composite number. So it has some factors, it has some prime factors in addition to Q and one, or it has some factors in addition to Q and one. And if it's a factor, then R divides Q. If R is a factor of Q, then R divides Q. So R has to be between one and Q because it's not one and it's not Q. So it's some prime number between one and Q. Okay, so if R divides Q, what is Q equal to? Q is equal to P plus one. So R divides P plus one. R divides Q, that means R divides P plus one because Q equals P plus one. Okay, so R is less than Q. We determined that there because it's it can't be Q. It has to be less than Q. And if it's less than Q, if it's an integer less than Q, then it's less than or equal to Q minus one. Q minus one is the last integer before Q, right? So it's less than or equal to Q minus one. And Q minus one equals P, right? Q minus one equals P. We get that right from here. So R is less than or equal to P, right? All right. So if R is in the set F, then R divides P. Why is that? Because if R is one of these primes from the initial set, then R has, because P is the product of all these primes, if R divides, if R is in that set, then R divides P because it's one of the factors in there, okay? So now R divides P and R also divides P plus one because we proved that right here. R divides Q and Q equals P plus one. So R divides P plus one. So now we use DIC. R divides PX plus P, P plus one Y, all right? So it div R divides P and R divides P plus one. So it divides this integer combination. Now R divides P, R divides P plus one. So R divides P plus one minus P because I said Y equals one, X equals negative one. So I have P plus one minus P, that's equal to what? Louder? One, so R divides one. What's the only number that divides one? One. One, one is the only thing that can divide one. So uh, we already said that R is a prime that is not one or Q. I mean, one is not a prime. So if I say R is a prime factor, we're saying it's not one, it's not Q. So how can you have a prime number that divides one? It's impossible. One is the only thing that divides one. So I have a now basically uh, uh, the assumption that R is in this set P is false because if R is in that set P, then R divides this capital P. Oh, sorry, if R is in the set F, then R divides capital P. And if R divides capital P, then R divides one and it's not one, that, that uh, oh, what did I just do? Okay. If R divides, uh, if R divides capital P and R is not equal to one, then, then that means that R is a number that's not one and divides one, which doesn't make sense. So that means that, so for any set of F primes, whatever that set is, I haven't told you which primes these are. That's just a finite set of primes. There's at least one prime missing. In case one, it's Q that's missing. In case two, it's R that's missing. R is a prime that's not one and not Q. And it's definitely not in this set because if it's in that set, that implies that R divides one, which is not true. All right, small note at the end. This is the idea behind Euclid's proof, but unfortunately, Set notation wasn't invented yet. His proof was much less elegant, probably took way more pages. This is much more elegant proof. Um, he, he didn't have any way to mathematically denote an arbitrary set of finite prime numbers, uh, a finite set of prime numbers. So he wasn't able to do this, which we're able to do in just one line. He, had to, he started with just three primes in, in his set and then he kept adding more primes uh, and so, this isn't exactly Euclid's proof, but it's the idea behind Euclid's proof. Put in modern notation, it fits onto one slide. All right, so that finite set of primes, no matter how many primes you have in that set, it's not enough. There's always at least one more. 
And then that's a new bigger finite set, but there's still primes missing from that one, either Qs or Rs, there's something missing. And then that's a bigger finite set, there's still primes missing from that one. So there's an infinite number of, uh, of primes. All right, you think you can do this in 10 minutes on the midterm? Okay, well, actually, this uh, proof is in the course notes in chapter six. So I think in that year when they did, did the midterm, that chapter might have been covered already. So it was just a proof from the course notes. That's why you've got to do every proof you can possibly find, all the extra problems, all the previous midterms, all the course notes exercises. If you do them all, then you've seen everything. A question can just show up on the midterm, and then you already know how to do it. You just do it in two or three minutes, it's done. This was the other question from that same midterm. Let A and B be integers, prove that A cubed divides B cubed if and only if A divides B. First direction is so easy, right? A divides B, that means B equals KA. You can look at this at home on the GitHub page if you want. Um, the other direction is harder. A cubed divides B cubed implies A divides B. Now, A cubed divides B cubed. Why is it that I can't just say B cubed equals K cubed times A cubed? Pardon me? Why can't I just say that B cubed equals K cubed A cubed? Tejas? Yeah, so I'm guaranteed that B cubed equals K times A cubed. I'm guaranteed that B cubed equals K times A cubed where K is an integer, but I'm not. I'm not guaranteed that that integer is a perfect cube. So it could just be seven. Seven is an integer. I'm guaranteed that it could be any integer. It could be seven. Seven's not a perfect cube. So I can't just start with that in my proof. All right, so uh, you guys proved it. Who proved it? You thought about it? Yeah, yeah. How did you prove it? Uh, I don't, but that was just on our way out and it was too fast, right? So that proof, I don't. I didn't. I didn't tell you that that proof is definitely okay, did I? No, I went. I went to get the answer. Okay. So what, what's the first step in this proof? Uh, so we say that a and b can both be written as the product of prime factors. All right. Okay. So stop there. You're going to give too much to the other students then. So we we write a and b as a product of uh, prime factors. Give me uh, a number, a composite number between one and fifty. 16. 16. Okay. 16 equals 2 to the 4. All right. Another number between uh, 1 and 50 that's composite. 42. 42. Okay. So 42. You can still see this. That equals what? Uh, 3, uh, 2, uh, you know, 6 times 7, right? So it's um, 2 times 2 to the 1 times 3 to the 1 times 7 to the 1. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so any number, composite number, you can factor it into powers of primes, all right? Now, let's make these the same. This, this is actually three times seven with what exponents? Zero. Zero, okay. So whatever number of primes the bigger number has in it, or whatever, the one that has more primes, you make that, uh, maybe B has more primes in it. So I put P1, P2, all the way up to PR. And it has some exponents. And A, A and B are integers, right? So A has P1 up to PR and uh, uh, exponents that, uh, for each of these primes, right? And uh, we have, they both go up to R because if one of them has fewer primes, we can just put a bunch of zeros in the exponents, okay? You got it? Now, what happens if, um, if uh, A squared divides B squared, then, hmm, so let's, let's use, do they have different color chalk here? They don't have different color chalk. No, you gotta bring your own. Ah, that sucks. All right, so let's square this. So it's this squared, then I just do this, right? If I'm squaring, if I'm squaring this, then I'm just squaring each of these, right? And if I'm squaring this, then I'm just squaring each of these. You can do the same proof with cubes instead of squares, but let's just do squares for now. Okay, now, if this divides that, then that means this has to divide that, and this has to divide that, and this has to divide that, right? So the powers here have to be at least as big as the powers there, because what happens if I have a number here, like nine to the seven, 
and here I only have nine to the six. How can that divide this? It's too big, right? It's too big to divide this. So all of these exponents, all of these exponents have to be uh, smaller than or equal to the exponents here. You got it? Yeah, look it over at home, okay, when you get the chance. So we have a, uh, alpha i is less than or equal to beta i for all i, all right? And that means that a divides b, all right? Now, if you're doing this type of problem at home, Tejas? Not cubing? Why is it squaring rather than cubing? All right, so this proof works even if you wanted to prove that a to the n, um, if you wanted to prove that a to the n divides b to the n implies that a divides b, the same proof works. So instead of squares, you put cubes. So you can have three, three, or you can have n and n. But the, the, the main, the main uh, point is that these exponents have to be less than or equal to the exponents. So if I have a to the n and b to the n, then I'm gonna have the same number throughout. So instead of two, I have n. I'm gonna get chalk all over my clothes. Okay, but uh, we have n, 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 n. So n's are all over the place. Those n's don't matter. What matters is that the four has to be less than or equal to the one if you want 16 to divide 42. So whatever this exponent, this is alpha one, this is beta one, the alpha one has to be less than or equal to the beta one. All the n's are the same. So those you can ignore and it's the alphas and the betas that matter. All these alphas have to be smaller than or equal to the beta. If it's larger, if I have seven to the power seven and only seven to the power six, there's no way that that divides this. All right, so if this happens to you on the, uh, uh, when you're doing the practice problems, you don't have the solutions, uh, you don't necessarily want to ask on Piazza. You want to figure out how you, you get given a proof like this. You have no idea what to do. Well, when I when I Googled this the other day, I said infinite number of primes in Google. First thing I get is Euclid's theorem. I click that. It says uh, the this is Euclid's theorem asserts that there's infinitely many prime numbers. Okay, so that's the right proof. And then I have a proof right here, Euclid's proof from Proposition 20 of Book 9 of the Elements. You just get it like that, right? So if you do get stuck, it's reading week, you can't come in person for office hours or something. You can just Google things and sometimes you'll get a good proof. Uh, likewise, I, I searched A squared divides B squared implies A divides B. I know that if I can prove it for squares, then I can prove it for cubes. So A squared divides B cubed, oh, sorry, A squared divides B squared implies A divides B. So first result is this right here, stack exchange. If A squared divides B squared, then B then A divides B. This is a duplicate of another question where they said, show that A to the N divides B to the N implies A divides B. All right, so the more complicated A to the N one is, is you have a link to there too. And then here's the proof right here, the proof that I just showed you. So if you do get stuck, try it on your own, spend two or three hours trying to figure it, figure it out on your own. If you can't figure it out after two, two or three hours, then you can Google it, see if someone else has proven it. And then, you know, that, that will save you some time. All right. Here's a midterm from uh, winter 2006. Note, I had no calculator. Do you think the instructors cared about that? <laughs> this person forgot their calculator. Do you think they got uh, any extra marks for that? Probably not, right? So, you know, it's your responsibility. It's 1,300 students. We're not going to, like, give certain people. Uh, we're not going to give extra grades to some people because they did it without a calculator or something, right? So if you forgot your calculator, then it's, that's, that's too bad. I think for this course, we're not allowed to use in calculators. No calculator. Okay, well, that's good. And, math, and for the final exam, you will need a calculator because, I mean, th when they were teaching this course, they were doing the GCD stuff before they were teaching this stuff. And for RSA and stuff like that, you're dealing with huge numbers and you need a calculator for some of that stuff. But for this half of the course, it's good that they're not letting you use calculator because I want to prove that A divides uh, B implies something else. Then you're going to check like, okay, three divides nine. Does that mean that three squared divides nine squared? Is the, is, do you want to type that into your calculator, spend 10 minutes doing that? Because you have to prove it for all A and all B. You can't just sub in A equals three and B equals nine. That's not enough, right? So you're wasting your time if you're trying to use a calculator. Just try to do, do it uh, analytically. All right, um, 
anyone that wants to go home, we're at uh, 4.50 now. If you want another practice problem, then we can do this one. Okay, and the answer is gonna be, uh, anyone that's going home, you're gonna, you're gonna see the solution to it on the uh, GitHub lecture notes anyway, so, right? So I'll give uh, one or two minutes for anyone that wants to leave to, uh, to clear the room, and then I'll do this problem, okay? There's some time you can spend thinking about it if you want. <laughs> 